Good afternoon and welcome. My name is Tim Poe. I'm Director of Telehealth with the UNC Cancer Network, and I would like to welcome all of you to our Medical and Surgical Oncology Lecture. This is our live lecture, August 22nd, 2018. A few preliminaries and then we'll meet our guest and get started. Uh, if you are having any technical difficulties at all, please call us, 919-445-1000, or email us at uncn at unc we have technical experts standing by who can help you with uh, any problems that you may be experiencing. Uh, you can find us on the web at unccn.org. We're on Facebook, we're on Twitter, we're on YouTube, all sorts of places. So uh, we do hope you'll find us on, at the web, on the web and on social media. Uh, we do use Poll Everywhere, and we are pleased to say that our presenter today has added several questions into Poll Everywhere, so we hope that you will all uh, take a, a little bit of time as, as the lecture goes on to respond to those questions. Two ways that you can use Poll Everywhere for this lecture. One is you can just go to pollev.com, that's P-O-L-L-E-V, uh, dot com forward slash unccn again polev.com forward slash unccn you can do that from any browser including a browser on a smartphone and then as the questions appear you'll see both the questions and then you can select the answers and respond there it's also easy to join us from any phone with texting capabilities You'll dial the number, you'll in the to field put in the number 22333 and in the message field you'll put in UNCCN. You do that one time today, uh, you'll get a message back saying that you've joined and then after that you can just put in the letter uh, that corresponds to whatever the answer is that's being, uh, of the question being shared. And then at, uh, towards the end of the lecture there'll be an opportunity for you to text in uh, any open-ended questions that you may have. So, mentioning poll everywhere, uh, here is our first question. Bacterial cells in the human body number in the, if you think that's thousands, you put in A, millions, B, billions, C, or trillions, D. You can go ahead and do that right now, and then uh, in just a few minutes, we'll look at that uh, poll and, and see what you've come up with and find out from our guests what the answer is. All right, so we are very pleased to have uh, Dr. Keiko here today, and let me shift my camera here. Dr. Keiko, welcome. Thank you. Nice to have you here. I'm very glad to have you here. Uh, let me uh, let our uh, our guests know a little bit about you. Uh, your work involves translational research, combining basic science with epidemiology to gain a better understanding of the etiology and pathogenesis of cancer, particularly colorectal cancer. Uh, you received pilot funding from the UNCGI SPORE to study the role of gut microbiota in the etiology of colorectal adenomas and cancer. The study will provide critical insights on the composition and diversity of the microbiota and their associations with adenomas, and the findings from this and future studies could lead to the development of strategies to manipulate the intestinal microbiota to prevent colorectal adenomas and cancer, as well as to identify individuals at high risk. Do we have that about right? Yes, thank you. All right, good. And what's, what's something we should know about you that maybe wasn't in the, that information there? That I love to travel. Mm -hmm. I have traveled twice to Ethiopia on mission trips. And I also have four children. Great, great. Well, we are so pleased to have you here today. Thank you so much. Thank I, you. I do have our, our uh, disclosures to read. So this activity has been uh, planned and implemented under the sole supervision of the course directors in association with the UNC Office of Continuing Professional Development. Dr. Thomas Shea consults with Spectrum Pharma and receives research support from Millennium, Atsuka, GSK, BMS, Novartis, and Seattle Genetics. Dr. James Coghill, MD and CPD staff, have no relevant financial relationships with commercial interests as defined by the ACCME. The speaker, Dr. Keiku, has no conflict of interest relevant to the presentation. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Let's see how, how we're doing on that poll. So again, you can go pollab.com forward slash UNCCN. You can also uh, go ahead and answer uh, by texting UNCCN to the number 22333 once to join, and then A thousands, B millions, C trillions, or uh, B, C, tr excuse me, A thousands, B millions, C billions, or D trillions. 
All right. Uh, looks like we're leading with trillions, with billions just behind. <laughs> How are they doing? <laughs> I think they're doing good. Uh -huh. I think they're doing good. So the answer is trillions. Is trillions. Yes. Wow. All right. Well, without further ado, I will pass the controls over to you. And so there's the keyboard with the arrow controllers and the mouse for the, for the cursor. So good afternoon. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, the uh, learning objectives for our talk today is going to be uh, in three steps. So we're going to uh, describe, be able to describe the gut microbiome and how changes in that gut microbiome comp composition influences health and disease. I will understand, I hope that by the end of this uh, lecture you'll understand how the gut microbiome interacts with the immune system to influence response to cancer therapy, especially immunotherapy. And uh, lastly, uh, we will discuss strategies to manipulate the gut microbiome to improve clinical outcomes. So before we start, I would like to go over just a few terms that we will come across in, uh, during the duration of this presentation. So what is the microbiota? The microbiota or microflora, as it used to be referred to, are the microorganisms that occupy a particular site or habitat. So for example, all the bacteria in the colon. Uh, so the colon is, uh, the, the bacteria in the colon will be the microbiota of the colon. Um, the bacteria in the skin will be called the microbiota of the skin. The microbiome, however, is the collective genomes of the microorganisms within a given host or environment. So all of the microorganisms on a, on a human body, uh, on or in a human body, is, is, is the microbiome. And then what is dysbiosis? I'm sure you've come across this term a lot uh, in the news and in just the, in just, uh, um, the lay media. Uh, dysbiosis is a pathological imbalance in the, micro, in the microbes uh, structure. So um, normally under normal homeostasis, there is the balance between good and bad uh, uh, microbi microbes in the, in, the, uh, in the gut. But however, um, something happens to bring about an imbalance. And so that's called dysbiosis. And then we also have di diversity. And diversity takes into account species, species richness and evenness. Um, richness is just the count of the species. So the bacteria that's there, the virus that's there, the fungi that's there. And evenness is the distribution of the different kinds of bacteria within the community. And then germ-free. Germ-free refers to um, uh, uh, a, an environment where that's free of living organisms. Um, only the host species is there. And then bacteria co-metabolites are bioactive substances produced by bacterial metabolism within the gut. So the human, as I mentioned, the human microbiome, I think with the advances in, in uh, molecular uh, sequencing technology, we have come in the last 10 to 15 years, we have come to know a lot more about the microbiome. And it's thought that we are outnumbered on the order of 10 to 1, which means that we have more microbial cells on us than human cells. And in fact, it is thought that the uh, microbiome uh, is our second genome and that we as humans are superorganisms, composite of human and microbial organisms. And majority of these uh, microbes reside in our gut. So the gut has anywhere from 10 to 100 trillion microbial cells. So what is the composition of the human microbiome? The human microbiome is comprised of bacteria, Fungi, fungi and viruses as well as archaea. However, the bacteria are the most uh, predominant. And uh, the predominant bacteria are mostly, belong mostly to the phylum, um, Firmicuitis, Bacteroidetes, Actinobacteria, Proteobacteria, and there are a few other ones. But the, the, uh, and then within the GI tract, so I mentioned earlier that the, the GI tract has the most uh, bacteria. And so within the GI tract, um, the density of the, uh, of, the, of the bacteria 
increases as you go down the GI tract with the highest density in the colon. So the colon has anywhere from 10 to the 11th grams of uh, bacteria per, uh, uh, 10 to 11 bacteria per gram of feces. So if we have all these bacteria, what are they doing to us? I mean, how, how do they benefit us? So there are several ways in which these bacteria are actually useful for us. So when we eat, they help to metabolize our food. Uh, they help with the digestion. They also help with nutrient uh, absorption. And they also help with uh, synthesis of vitamins, uh, such as vitamins K, folate, biotin, uh, magnesium, and calcium. And most importantly, they help to produce short-chain fatty acids, uh, which serve as energy sources for the uh, colonocytes, which are epithelial cells within the colon. And the gut microbiome also uh, plays an important role in uh, immunity. So I'm sure you've probably heard of the, immune, uh, the hygiene hypothesis, so that uh, people in the Western world um, uh, uh, have a cleaner environment, and so they, um, they lost their immunity. So I give, for example, I am originally from Nigeria, and when I uh, moved from Nigeria to here, my microbiome changed. And so when I went back home, anytime I go back home, I'm not able to drink the water like I used to. If I do, I get sick. That's because the bacteria help to train our immune system. Uh, uh, um, they help with the development of the immune system. And studies in animal models have also shown that, it's really in germ-free animal models, have shown that those mice have an underdeveloped immune system. However, when uh, you introduce bacteria, the immune system in these mice are developed. Lastly, the bacteria are able to uh, uh, help uh, with homeostasis, so they provide a balance in the, in the GI tract. Um, they also protect against uh, pathogens from invading in the GI tract. So um, while we know that the bacteria, uh, the gut microbiota, serve an important role, uh, they are not innocent bystanders anyways. Um, it turns out that they also play a role in various diseases. Uh, so, for, so, for example, they've been uh, associated with diabetes, obesity, inflammatory bowel disease, uh, autism, asthma, infectious diarrhea, and cancer. So many of the studies that have looked at them, the initial studies that looked at the microbiome, uh, were mostly asking the question, who is there? Because now we're able to actually probe to see, to know who is there. And many of these studies uh, were then moved from who is there to be able to link uh, who is there with diseases. And, and uh, many of these studies were association studies. So we, we know that the, uh, from these initial studies, we now know that the gut microbiota is, is influenced by a range of factors, and that there's a complex interplay between uh, the gut microbiota, uh, host genetics, environmental factors such as diet, and the immune response. And this, all of this together with, uh, contributes to, could contribute to uh, the various disease phenotypes. So in terms of cancer, um, the gut microbiota has been associated with various uh, cancers. I think one of the well-known uh, well ones is the stomach cancer and Helicobacter uh, pylori. Uh, salmonella has also been linked with uh, gallbladder cancer. Um, in terms of uh, colorectal cancer, there's a lot more known about uh, bacteria involvement in colorectal cancer. And in fact, some uh, studies have shown that spe specific uh, species such as E. coli, Fusobacterium, and Enterotoxigenic Bacteroides fragilis uh, are implicated in uh, etiology of colorectal cancer. In addition, pancreatic cancer, liver cancer, uh, other cancers such as head and neck, uh, melanoma, lung cancer, breast cancer, prostate cancer, uh, ovarian cancer, and lymphoma have also been associated with the gut microbiota. So while many of these uh, studies, initial studies, were association studies uh, that uh, they showed that an alteration, which is uh, dysbiosis, 
uh, is the mechanism by which the uh, gut microbiota uh, contributes to uh, various cancers. And so on this slide, I'm showing uh, that under normal healthy, under normal uh, physiologic conditions, there's a homeostasis between beneficial bacteria and uh, pathogenic uh, uh, bacteria, bacteria uh, within the gut. However, in terms of colorectal cancer, because this has been more worked out for colorectal cancer than other cancers. Um, however, changes in lifestyle, diet, uh, the microbial composition could contribute to dysbiosis, which leads to a decrease in beneficial uh, bacteria and an increase in pathogenic bacteria. And then together with uh, the, the increase in procrastinogenic bacteria, bacterial antigens and in, uh, bacterial metabolites, could create an environment that enhances adenoma development and ultimately contribute to cancer. And one of the mechanisms that we think that, that dysbiosis may contribute to colon cancer is through uh, um, the barrier function. So uh, the, uh, because of the barrier function failure, the bacteria is able to invade the uh, mucosa and then interact with the immune system to lead to inflammation and activate uh, oncogenic uh, pathways that further drive the carcinogenesis process. So on, the, on this slide, um, this recent study by Fulbright and group have actually looked at the link the hallmarks of cancer with the uh, with the gut microbiota. So on the outside circle is showing the various hallmarks of, of cancer, and the inside circle ha uh, has the various aspects of the microbiota that's linked to the hallmarks of cancer. So for example, uh, the E. coli that produces the, that has PKs produces a toxin that's known as colibactin. And this uh, toxin can uh, enhance uh, uh, the uh, proliferative pathways in, in cancer uh, to, to, again, further enhance the, the carcinogenesis process. In addition, the uh, colibactin in E. coli is known to contribute to genomic instability and mutation via DNA damage, activation of DNA damage. Uh, one of the uh, more uh, well-known studies is looking at fusobacterium. And we know that uh, fusobacterium can bind to epithelial cells via its 5A uh, uh, um, antigen and bind to epithelial cells and then activate uh, wind signaling pathway again uh, to sustain proliferation in, in cancer. So I think that what's really, really cool uh, this time is, is the, is the um, studies that are uh, now coming out and showing that the microbiome influences response to um, immunotherapy. Uh, in the last three or four years, several studies have come out to, to show this. And so in the next couple of slides, where I'm going to discuss about uh, the gut microbiome and their role in cancer therapy. So one of the uh, in this the, one of the earliest studies. Uh, this was done in 2005. I, I mentioned that Fusobacterium uh, nucleatum has been associated with uh, colorectal cancer, and this has been consistently shown across various studies. And so in this study, they wanted to uh, look at the, the relationship between the abundance of Fusobacterium and uh, in the tissue, in the tumor tissue, and colorectal cancer survival. And so what I'm showing here is the survival probability on the one axis and then the uh, survival uh, in cancer, colorectal cancer specific survival. And what they show is that uh, the patients that have uh, in red high abundance of fusobacteria uh, had uh, worse survival compared to patients that have low fusobacterium or no fusobacterium at all. And then in terms of prostate cancer, so in this study, they looked at, uh, they looked at um, the uh, patients that were treated, prostate cancer patients that were treated with androgen axis uh, targeted therapies. And uh, they asked the question, does the microbiota differ in these patients uh, that were uh, based on treatment? And so uh, 
this on this uh, left panel is showing the, the red is showing patients that were treated and the uh, the um, gray is patients that were not treated and here what they found is this is looking at the bacteria profile so the the closer they are together the sim the more similar the bacteria profiles and the further apart they are the, the di there's uh, the difference between the profiles and so you can sort of see that the Patients who receive the androgen axis targeted therapies sort of tended to have a, a, a somewhat different uh, profile compared to the patients who did not have that therapy. And the right panel is just a heat map showing the, uh, the particular bacteria within the different uh, groupings. So before we move on, I'd just like to review uh, a, a quickly uh, the, uh, the interaction between the uh, mucosal immune system and the gut microbiome, because I think this is important uh, for, the, for the next few slides that we're going to talk about. So this slide is showing the, uh, the, um, the, is showing the, the, um, the colon, the gut. And so here, uh, the gut is lined by uh, enterocytes. And on top, at the top layer uh, is, is lined, is covered by a mucin layer. And then within the lamina propria, so within this region, are various uh, immune cells. And the, um, the for example, uh, B cells uh, will produce, produce Ig, Ig that's reduced, re, uh, released into the, into the lumen. And um, the uh, bacteria or their products can interact with uh, the various immune system to either enhance uh, treatment or to enhance uh, to either enhance treatment or to uh, uh, influence uh, uh, treatment outcomes. And so um, the the bacteria interaction with the immune system uh, is is very key to the next uh, couple of uh, slides that we're going to talk about. So in terms of immunotherapies, they're becoming more popular uh, in, in treating uh, patients. And the immunotherapies generally, uh, what they do is to uh, um, identify proteins. So cancer cells express certain proteins that help them to evade immune recognition. And um, these this proteins, uh, uh, cytotoxic T lymphocytes, antigen 4, and programmed cell death protein uh, 1, or PDL and PDL1. And these um, this antibodies or, or checkpoint inhibitors block these proteins and then enhance the immune system to be able to fight the cancer. And uh, some of these uh, checkpoint inhibitors include ipilimumab, uh, pembro, uh, pembro, and nivolumab. All right, so uh, looks like we already have a few responses, but uh, I'm wondering if those didn't clear from the, from the last, uh, let me go ahead and set this, I'm wondering if those didn't clear from our last poll. Uh, yeah, there we go, they're shifting okay. now. So, okay. so are bacteria beneficial or detrimental to our immune system? And if you think uh, that they're beneficial, they help and assist our immune system, you'll put in A, detrimental, they harm the immune system, B, both beneficial and detrimental, C, or none of the above, D. So, uh, for, and it, it looks like that may not have cleared from the, from the previous poll, but uh, we'll, I'll make sure that the next one is cleared. Looks like we're, we're having a lot of thing, folks that think that it's both uh, beneficial and detrimental. Uh, Dr. Keku, how are they doing? They're doing good. Mm -hmm. um, so it, the answer is uh, C. They can be beneficial and they can be detrimental. Uh, they can be beneficial in, the, in terms of enhancing the immune, immune system to respond better, to uh, allow the, the therapies to work better. They can be detrimental when they kick the immune system into overgear and, uh, and uh, contribute to diseases like inflammatory bowel diseases. All right, very good. Okay. So I mentioned in the last slide that uh, there are immune checkpoint inhibitors. So this, the two most common ones are the uh, CTLA-4 
uh, therapy and uh, PDL1 therapy. And we'll talk more uh, in the next couple of slides about this. But this slide is just kind of giving an overview of how this works. So, for example, in terms of CTLA4 uh, treatment with uh, um, anti-CTLA4 therapy, um, B. fragilis is one bacterium bacteria that uh, uh, using the, through its peptidoglycan that's on the surface of the bacteria can activate IL-12 and pro-inflammatory signals to actually enhance the efficacy of anti-CTL4 therapy. And then in terms of, uh, of PDL1 therapy, addition of bifidobacterium, which is a good good commensal bacteria, uh, can contribute to activation of the uh, dendritic cells and, uh, and enhance the efficacy of uh, anti-PDL1 therapy. So in the next couple of slides, I'm going to talk more, be more specific about uh, uh, certain studies that have looked at uh, CTL, CTLA-4 uh, blockade and the gut microbiota. And these are uh, a little bit complex, but just follow along. So in this particular study, uh, they were interested in looking at the, uh, whether the gut microbiome modulates the effect of uh, anti-CTL-4 uh, monoclonal antibody, uh, antibody uh, blockade. And what they did in this experiment is that they had some mice uh, that were inoculated with uh, MCA-205 uh, tumors, and uh, the, some of these mice were kept in specific pathogen-free environment, and some were kept in germ-free environment. Um, and then the, the mice either received um, uh, control or they received antibody, uh, antibodies against CTL4, CTLA4, um, both, specific, both in SPF and germ-free conditions. And what they found was that uh, the animals that uh, received uh, anti-CTLA4 anti um, had better uh, response. So they had, uh, the tumor sizes were reduced, significantly reduced, compared to animals that were kept in germ-free environment, suggesting that bacteria may be uh, uh, interacting with the, uh, the anti-CTLA-4 treatment. And then they wanted to know whether, it to, be, to be sure, they, want to, uh, they did another experiment where they um, either give the, the mice water or a cocktail of antibiotics or specific antibiotics. And they asked the question, uh, what happens to the tumor size in the presence or absence of anti-CTLA-4 treatment? And uh, in the, so this is the, this is the uh, control. And comparing those animals that, have, um, uh, that re received antibiotics, they found that uh, the, the, the effect of anti-CTLA-4 was, uh, was sort of uh, um, um, diminished with antibiotic treatment. And they found the same thing when they used individual antibiotics, except that with um, cholecystin, the effect was not, uh, was not significant. So then they, they ask the question, are they, uh, what's the relationship between the, uh, the response they, they saw and the immune system? And so they, uh, again, they looked at the, in this, uh, in this slide, what they did was they looked at the, uh, the CD, CD4, uh, proliferation of CD4 uh, immune cells, and um, in animals that received either water or antibiotics and also received, either received anti-CTLA-4, or not. And in animals that received uh, just water with anti-CTLA-4, the pro proliferation of, of, uh, of CD4 positive cells was markedly increased, but antibiotic treatment diminished that. And then they asked, they looked at production of uh, interferon gamma and TNF-alpha um, in these cells. And again, the animals that received uh, uh, water and uh, anti-CTLA-4 uh, had significantly increased um, uh, production of the cytokines, whereas antibiotics reduced the effect. So in, in data that I'm not showing you, they identified specific bacteria that were sort of modulating this effect. And so here they uh, looked at the tumor sizes in, uh, and in animals that were treated with uh, either uh, sodium chloride, which is a, a carrier, or various uh, bacteria. And what they noted was that the tumor sizing and then the animals either also received water 
or antibiotics. And what they noticed was that the animals that were treated with, uh, with anti-CTLA-4 plus Bacolderia and, uh, and uh, Bacteroides fragilis had significantly redu reduced uh, tumor sizes. Uh, they also noted a significant reduction for B fragilis and B theta iotiomicron. And uh, on this panel, the, it's just showing the uh, histology in this in these mice. Okay. So those studies were done in, in, in mice. And so the next question is, how, what's the clinical relevance of this? And so they uh, took... Uh, fecal samples from 25 patients uh, that were metastatic melanoma patients and, um, and uh, characterized the bacteria in those patients. And so in this left panel, we're showing the, uh, the, the profiles of the, the microbiota. And so the, the patients clustered into three groups uh, with cluster A, B, and C. Uh, cluster A and B were predominantly uh, dominated by Bacteroidetes uh, phyla, and uh, whereas cluster C was predominantly dominated by Prevotella. And then the next thing they did was that they took fecal samples from each of these clusters and put them into mice. Uh, um, and, um, and ask the question, do the, um, do the tumors, what's the effect of the, and the, the mice were treated with uh, CTLA-4, and it turns out that the effect of CTLA-4 uh, was enhanced in mice that received cluster, uh, cluster C, uh, fecal microbial transplant, uh, than uh, A or B. Again, suggesting that the bacteria, that the microbiota uh, modulates the efficacy of anti-CTLA-4 blockade. So those, uh, another study in 2014, another immune checkpoint inhibitor that's currently uh, used in also treating melanoma and other cancers is uh, anti-PD-1. And so in this study, uh, just published recently, they also looked at the gut microbiome and they found that it modulates the response to immunotherapy in melanoma patients. All right, so we have our next question. Is it beneficial to have highly diverse gut microbiome, a highly diverse mi mi gut microbiome made up of many different bacterial species? If you think that's a yes, you'll send us an A, uh, no a B, or both of those, yes and no a C. And we'll give you just a few more seconds to, to respond if you would. So again, is it beneficial to have a highly diverse gut microbiome made up of many different bacterial species? Yes, A, no, B, or uh, both yes and no, C. And we did make sure that we uh, cleared our, re our previous responses. So the answer is A. Is it's a. beneficial to have a diverse uh, microbiome. Very good. Okay. So in this study uh, that I was uh, beginning to introduce to you earlier, uh, so in those melanoma patients, they, uh, they did an experiment where they, um, they took the uh, fecal microbiota, actually they, they looked at the fecal microbiota from the patients and they were able to see that the, the fecal microbiota differed um, uh, on this, on this uh, left panel, differed uh, by response to anti-PD-1 PD, uh, treatment. So uh, responders are in blue and uh, non-responders are in red. So they took the fecal microbiome from these patients um, and oral microbiome um, and then they did uh, shotgun, I mean, they did, uh, they looked at the diversity, and they found that among respondents, the respondents tend to have a higher diversity uh, compared to non-responders. Again, suggesting that having a, having a higher diverse, uh, a, a diverse uh, microbiome is beneficial than a non-diverse microbiome. So they looked at the uh, relationship between the they looked at the relationship between the um, the uh, microbiome, the diver the diversity and uh, pro uh, um, progression free survival in these patients treated with anti PD one immunotherapy, and again 
patients that had a higher in blue, uh, patients that had a higher um, diversity uh, had prolonged, had better prolonged uh, PFS than patients that had low or intermediate uh, diversity. And then they specifically looked at, uh, at, uh, at uh, uh, PFS in, 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 in relation to specific bacteria. So they looked at Fecalibacterium, which has been shown to be beneficial, and they found that patients that have a high abundance of Fecalibacterium um, had a better uh, PFS. And where, while, while uh, patients that had a higher abundance of Bacteroidealis, uh, which was more abundant in the, in the non-responders, uh, had low, had uh, was uh, was PFS. So this uh, this is just showing that uh, the composition of the uh, bacteria differs by anti PD one immunotherapy. And so, and this panel, this uh, uh, the responders again are in blue, and this is just showing all of the bacteria, specific bacteria that are highly abundant in responders, and the red is showing all of the bacteria that are uh, uh, highly abundant in in uh, non-responders, and and they they looked at um, then they looked at the uh, density of bact of uh, CD8 immune cells in relation to response. So responders tended to have a higher density of immune uh, CD8 positive cells compared to non-responders, and this was significant. And then they they looked at the correlation between uh, so some of the bacteria that were highly abundant in uh, responders and uh, bacteroidealis that was not, uh, that was also highly abundant in non-respondents. And they looked at the correlation between these bacteria and, and various immune markers. And what they found was that there was a strong uh, correlation between, a significant correlation between uh, the bacteria that were uh, expressed in, in um, responders Compare and uh, uh, a, a strong positive correlation between bacteria that were in responders, whereas bacteroidealis that was um, that was expressed in non-responders uh, showed an inverse uh, association with several of the immune markers. Again, suggesting that the bacteria uh, acts by enhancing the immune uh, system to to modulate the response to therapy. So next, they, uh, they looked at uh, fecal transplants from the patients that were treated with anti-PD-1. Uh, they put these uh, transplants into avatar mouse models. And um, so here they, 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 they looked at the tumor, si the, um, the tumor size from animals that, were, um, that received FMT from either responders or non-responders. And animals that, uh, that received uh, FMT from responders had uh, smaller tumors compared to uh, animals that receive uh, uh, FMT from um, non-responders. Again, they looked at the uh, CD8 uh, positive cells within the tumor and within the gut, and they noted that they, the responders high, had a high abundance of, um, of CD8 within the tumor, so within the tumor microenvironment, as well as, as, well as within the uh, gut itself. Again, um, suggesting that the bacteria uh, modulates the efficacy of uh, anti-PD-1 therapy uh, and that uh, it does so via activating the immune uh, response. A more recent study uh, also confirmed this, so this is confirmed in another study uh, where they looked at, again, metastatic uh, melanoma patients and, again, the they were able to show that the bacteria profiles differed uh, uh, between patients that respond to anti-PD-1 treatment compared to patients that did not respond. So while all of the studies to date have looked at specific bacteria, um, I mean they've looked at bacteria profiles and, uh, and their relationship with um, um, uh, immune checkpoint inhibitors, uh, there are few studies that are, there, there are few specific bacteria that have been uh, identified, particularly uh, Acamansia, uh, Mucinophilia, uh, Bifidobacterium species, Fecalibacterium, Prasnusi, and Bacteroides fragilis. However, uh, additional studies are needed to actually confirm that 
this uh, specific bacteria, this uh, the specific bacteria, and then also confirm the mechanisms by which they work. So, for example, in this study, they looked at uh, Akkermansia mycelia and the response to anti-PD-1 uh, immunotherapy. And they showed that patients that had partial response uh, uh, stable, and stable disease had a high abundance of Akkermansia uh, compared to uh, patients that uh, had uh, progressive disease. And they were able to correlate the uh, abundance of Akkermansia with various uh, immune uh, cytokines, and they noted that uh, this uh, correlated with uh, uh, progression-free survival. So to, to, uh, up to this point, I've uh, sort of shared with you uh, various studies that I've looked that, uh, that suggest that the gut microbiota modulates the uh, efficacy of immunotherapy, and uh, especially uh, PD-1 uh, PD PD and um, anti-CTLA-4 uh, uh, therapy. So I think going forward, um, going forward, I think that what is needed is to sort of, again, be able to confirm how this immune, the uh, immune checkpoints uh, and the microbiome interact. So I, I, I foresee uh, in, the, in the near future where we can take uh, fecal microbiota from patients um, that uh, responders and non-responders and put them into avatar mouse models and then be able to work out the mechanisms uh, by looking at um, the uh, FMT, by looking at the FMT uh, from responders and non-responders and uh, identifying specific bacteria and their contribution in enhancing the uh, immune, enhancing the uh, immune activation and, uh, and the efficacy of, of these checkpoint inhibitors. So while we've mainly focused on immunotherapy up to this point, uh, the gut microbiome also influences other uh, chemotherapy. All right, and another question. Colorectal cancer patients undergoing treatment with uh, irinotican, maybe you can pronounce that. Iron, irinotican. Thank you. Have which of the following side effects? Chest pain, A is A, gas, B, severe diarrhea, C, or no side effect, D. So the answer is C. Uh, they have severe diarrhea. And in the next couple of slides, we'll, we'll talk more about how that happens. All right. Nice job. Good job. So, the, um, so this slide sort of is, is busy, but um, I'll walk you through it. Um, so I've shown you that the gut microbiome um, enhances the efficacy of immune checkpoint inhibitors. On the other hand, the gut microbiome can also uh, have toxic effects. And so this slide is just uh, showing some of the mechanisms by which this, uh, we think that this bacteria, the gut microbiota, um, and, uh, can enhance uh, the efficacy or toxicity of some of the chemotherapy drugs. So, for example, cyclophosphamide um, causes severe uh, damage to the intestinal epithelium, but in the, mean, in the meantime, this severe damage uh, allows bacteria to cross into secondary lymphoid organs, and then the bacteria in the secondary lymphoid organs can activate actually uh, TH17 and TH1 immune responses. And which then enhances the efficacy of, of cyclophosphamide. We already, so translocation is one of the mechanisms. Uh, we already talked about immunomodulation via uh, the um, CTL, uh, CTL4, CTLA4 uh, blockade and anti pdl one In terms of metabolism, the um, bacteria can actually um, uh, metabolize, so, so metabolize certain of the drugs and, and uh, have some toxic side effects. And then in terms of uh, enzyme degradation, and I'm going to show you examples in the next couple of slides, I'm just giving you an overview here. So the, the, in terms of enzyme uh, degradation, bacteria can actually um, uh, be responsible for activation or deactivation of certain drugs and, uh, and influence whether they work or not. 
And lastly, we uh, mentioned reduced diversity. So we mentioned reduced diversity before. Reduced diversity, such as microbial dysbiosis, can actually be detrimental to uh, patients undergoing uh, chemotherapy. You want a diverse uh, microbiota. So I give you an example here of a study where they show that antibiotics can boost the activity of gem gemcitabine. So gemcitabine is one of the drugs that's used for uh, cancer treatment. And uh, it turns out that bacteria can inactivate, uh, that some patients are resistant to gemcitabine. And it's thought that bacteria inactivates the uh, gemcitabine so that it's not as effective. And so in this study, uh, what they did was uh, looking in mouse. Uh, they um, inoculated these mice with uh, E. coli nisso, which is a, gram, uh, which is a, um, a gamma proteobacteria, and, um, it's, it, um, and uh, it can be uh, affected by uh, treatment with Cipro. So these animals were also treated with Cipro, or, uh, and as well as gemcitabine, or without gemcitabine. And in the red on the left panel, you can see that animals that received Cipro and gemcitabine had uh, significantly reduced size tumors compared to animals that received uh, Cipro without gemcitabine. And then they took this experiment further. Again, to, uh, they took this experiment further. They inoculated these mice with wild-type E. coli uh, with or without gemcitabine. And then they, uh, they identified the particular enzyme within the E. coli that is uh, making, causing the resistance to gemcitabine. And so um, the, this, this enzyme is cytidine. Uh, uh, deaminase. And so they uh, knocked out the cytidine deaminase from this, uh, from the E. coli and, uh, and then uh, inoculated the mice with those. So mice either got uh, E. coli without uh, CDD or, uh, uh, or with CDD and uh, with, with or without gemcitabine. And what they're showing here is that on the right panel is that the, um, uh, the animals that received um, um, the CDD the, um, the E. coli without the CDD plus gemcitabine had significantly smaller size tumors compared to the, to the others. Again, suggesting that knocking out the, uh, the activity of the enzyme in the bacteria enhances the efficacy of gemcitabine. And then they wanted to know how this is working. So in this, on this slide, what I'm showing is they had uh, animals treated with gemcitabine uh, uh, and individual antibiotics, so a combination of gemcitabine and antibiotics, and what uh, or uh, gemcitabine and the uh, bacteria without the cytidine deaminase, and what they, they measured apoptosis. And what they found is that animals that received gemcitabine and, uh, and antibiotics had significantly more apoptosis, um, and as well as animals that received gemcitabine without, with bacteria without the cytidine deaminase also had higher uh, apoptosis compared to, uh, compared to gemcitabine alone or antibiotic treatment alone. Again, suggesting that um, apoptosis is uh, one of the mechanisms by which uh, this works. So I also mentioned earlier that um, the gut microbiota can, um, can um, metabolize certain drugs. So ironotecan is a drug that's used in the treatment of metastatic colon cancer. 40% of patients develop life-threatening diarrhea. And ironotecan, when it's given, is an inactive drug. However, it's activated in the liver uh, into the toxic form that kills uh, the cancer cells. And then before it's released back into the inter into the uh, intestine, it's converted into an in inactive form that's excreted into the bile and then into the intestine. However, bacteria within the intestines can reactivate uh, the uh, irinotecan um, to its active form, the SN38, which then uh, causes damage to the intestinal lining and causes the severe diarrhea. So in this study, by, in 2010, Wallace and group um, showed that in, 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 in animal models, they showed that animals that received uh, irinotecan or CPT-11 alone had severe bloody uh, diarrhea compared to animals that received uh, uh, CPT-11 plus an inhibitor. The diarrhea was, uh, was uh, significantly reduced. 
and then the um, then the histology is shown here. So you can see that the animals that received uh, CPT11 alone, the the histology is is uh, the mucosa is really shows just really really terrible, whereas the uh, the inhibitor protects the mucosa from that effect. So this, uh, this slide is a summary of what we've talked about so far. So we've talked about how bacteria and the, uh, how bacteria can interact uh, with the immune system to enhance the efficacy of uh, chemotherapy, or it can interact, or it can also interact with uh, the chemotherapy drugs to produce toxic side effects. So we talked about uh, cyclophosphamide, how it can cause uh, damage, but then that, that damage uh, to the epithelial cells allow the bacteria to, uh, to translocate uh, to the, uh, and, and, and uh, the translocation of the bacteria to the lymphoid organs then uh, lead to um, stimulation of the immune, immune system which can then enhance the efficacy of cyclophosphamide. I mentioned also that the um, that the uh, um, irinotecan can be uh, made uh, activated in the intestines by beta -glu glucuronidases in the, produced by bacteria, and this can lead to toxic side effects and diarrhea in these patients. We've also talked about how the um, We've also talked about the immune checkpoint inhibitors and how bacteria can enhance their effic efficacy by activating various components of the immune, immune uh, uh, system to enhance their efficacy. And lastly, the bacteria can also uh, activate or produce metabolites, and these metabolites can have various impacts also on the efficacy of uh, chemotherapy. So, where does all of this lead? I think that it's a it's an exci it's exciting times. I think that uh, the the future directions for this field uh, calls for um, mechanisms or strategies uh, whereby we can manipulate the gut microbiota to identify beneficial strains that could improve uh, anti-cancer immunosurveillance or cancer outcomes. Um, also. Um, we need strategies to be able to enrich for favorable bacteria. So either through prebiotics or probiotics. So prebiotics are food sort of uh, items that enhance bacteria, enhance growth of good bacteria, uh, or probiotics or diet. So shifting from the Western diet to Mediterranean diet or, or a low carb diet. There's a lot of studies out there on fecal microbiota microbial transplantation, especially with uh, patients that have C. difficile. Um, but um, while it is exciting, uh, there are a few caveats. So going forward, we need to be able to determine are we going to uh, um, have lyophilized and encapsulated feces from healthy donors with our cancer, or are we going to uh, administer um, fecal um, uh, transplants orally or rectally, and then there are challenges. So, how do we select the optimal tumor, uh, optimal donors? And then, do we, you know, once we identify the optimal donors, how do we ensure that we have sufficient uh, material for long term and use and for repeated uh, treatment of patients? Next, we also need to, to be able to define a probiotic mixture of several bacteria species because I don't think it's one bacteria, but I think it will be a, 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 a mixture of bacteria that could be better than one species that could be, uh, that could, uh, be used to improve the therapeutic effects of some of these uh, uh, chemotherapeutic drugs. And then lastly, we need effective strategies to target. So I showed you the... Uh, the, the um, the case with irinotecan, we need to be able to target microbial enzymes uh, involved in drug metabolism so that we can reduce some of the toxic side effects uh, from chemotherapy. So this is already happening. So I, I, on this slide, I just show you a couple of uh, studies, clinical trials that are already ongoing, uh, looking for ways to manipulate the microbiome to enhance response to cancer immunotherapy. So for example, there's a study uh, at MD Anderson where they're um, adding, uh, for patients, are adding half, half a cup of beans per day into their regular diet. 
and the, the, uh, the outcome is to look at change in fecal microbiome from baseline uh, to after treatment. And so these are exciting times and I think that the results from these studies uh, can be translated in the future to, to be able to identify specific bacteria that can uh, uh, enhance the field of immunotherapy. Thank you. Dr. Keku, thank you so much. This has been fascinating. Uh, we want to uh, give you an opportunity to ask questions, uh, so please go ahead and share those as, as quickly as you can, and we'll get to as many of those as we can. Um, they're absolutely fascinating. I'll, I'll start off with a couple of questions while we wait for our uh, listeners to share theirs. So you mentioned uh, with colorectal cancer the, fu the fusobacterium and the benefits there. Uh, do, we, do we know specific ways to increase the, the fusobacterium? You mentioned the probiotics. Um, at this point, is, is that something that we can say definitively this strategy or that strategy will, will lead to an increase that will, therefore, we can intuit, you know, uh, help, help with the, the uh, long-term prognosis of, of yeah. colorectal cancer? Yeah, so in, ter so in, terms, of, uh, mm -hmm. in terms of fusobact, in terms of fusobacterium, mm -hmm. it's actually uh, detrimental in colorectal cancer, and so... Oh, that uh, one's detrimental, yeah, sorry. Yeah, that's uh, detrimental, okay. and so... Finding ways, so uh, finding ways to sort of reduce the uh, uh, fusobacterium in the feces. Does does do we use probiotics? Mm -hmm. I think that we're still in the infant stages mm -hmm. and don't have uh, a definite mm -hmm. answer yet. Should we, you know, should we have a cocktail mm -hmm. uh, of probiotics? Should we have a cocktail of bacteria that can sort mm -hmm. of mitigate that? I think the jury is still out on that. All right, thank yeah. you, and thank you for that clarification. All right, this is one I, I shared as well. Uh, do you feel that over-the-counter probiotics are useful in current medicine? Uh, I think some studies have shown that they're useful, but I think that there are studies, uh, so for example, last week I read a study where they showed that patients taking uh, um, lactobacillus are actually having a lot of lactic acidosis. And so mm -hmm. I think that taking these probiotics uh, one has to be careful and maybe uh, work in tangent with uh, with the uh, medical doctors. All right, thank yeah. you. And a related question: Should everyone take probiotics daily? Well, <laughs> I eat I eat a yogurt daily. Uh huh. So that's mm -hmm. my that's my short answer. Mm -hmm. I think that there ben there there are benefits, um, mm -hmm. but I think that the the there are still studies to. You know, we're still a long ways from actually defining exactly the right amount of probiotics. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right. And uh, do you know the name of the MD Anderson study? Um, I don't know the name off the top of my head, but there's a reference on that slide. And so I think you'll be able to find it online. It's an ongoing study. Great, great. And, and just a reminder, all of the slides are all available uh, at our site, unccn.org. So how, do, how does a clinician benefit the, the, the benefits of, of antibiotics um, that sort of with treating infection with chemotherapy? And I'm sure you get asked this a lot. With, uh, you, you specifically with, with uh, Cipro and, and, and gemcitabine, you brought up that, that, um, the, the benefit of, of the two. Uh, I'm guessing that we haven't figured out uh, uh, something to, to benefit um, antibiotics with every chemotherapy out there yet. Yes, uh -huh. I, I would agree with that. Mm -hmm. I think that um, with um, with some of this, this, so the study that I showed mm -hmm. was done in animal models, and so mm -hmm. you know, translating that, I think we're still sometimes off. Sure. But but I, I think that we're slowly m moving into the era where mm -hmm. we would be typing to patients microbiome to see what's there mm -hmm. and then be able to tailor their treatment based on that profile but we're, we're not there yet mm -hmm. yeah okay well, yes. it's an exciting time and yeah. a lot of, uh, let's see any other questions we really need to go ahead and wrap up uh, so we'll, we'll go ahead and move on from there and I want to share just a couple of other slides and uh, regarding our upcoming uh, 
uh, upcoming lectures. We do want to thank uh, the North Carolina Generous General Assembly for their generous support of Lineberger, the Lineberger Comprehensive Cancer Center, and the University Cancer Research Fund. We want to thank Mary King, Veneranda Obore, and John Powell for all the work that they do to make each and every one of these lectures possible. We want to uh, let you know that on September 12th, we have an RN and Allied Health Lecture, Immunotherapy 101 with Dr. Armistead, and then a Medical and Surgical Oncology Lecture on September 26th at noon, Optune in Newly Diagnosed Glioblastoma with Dr. Kagi. Uh, he'll actually have the Optune here as part of that presentation, so I'm looking forward to that as well. Uh, Self-paced online courses, we're always putting uh, these live courses online, and we have two new ones online now, Breast Imaging Technologies, Cancer Detection and Personalized Medicine with Dr. Kuzmiak, and Using Biomarkers to Plan Adjuvant Therapy in Breast Cancer with Dr. Carey. So uh, those are online now, and we'll continue adding our lectures, including Dr. Keiku's, which should be there in three to four weeks, and the uh, video should be in our, in our library by the end of the week, if you would like to watch that uh, or share that with others. All right. Thank you so much. We really really appreciate, again, Thank this you. has been fascinating. We really appreciate your Thank being you. here. We appreciate our entire audience. Thank you for attending. Uh, please spread the word to your colleagues. Uh, please join us for future lectures. Please also spread the word about our learning portal where you can uh, take any of these uh, courses online for credit as well as receiving credit today. Uh, you can find us on the web, unccn.org. Thank you, and we'll see you next time. Thank you again, Dr. Kiku. Thank you.